Welcome back to the All Things Everything podcast presented by Gulf Coast Smoke. My name is Alonzo. And I'm Sabrina. And this is episode 10. And for 10, I think we got a great guest. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think we got a really, really great guest. You guys are really going to enjoy this interview that we had with our great guest. We'll let him introduce himself in just a little bit. You guys probably know who it is based off of the thumbnail and all that stuff. But, uh, man, this past weekend we competed in Laredo, Texas at the Pit Kings Laredo CBA competition. And what a weird weekend. (laughs) What a weird weekend. Yeah. I mean, there's zero excuses. I'll never, ever say, like, this is why we didn't do good. This is why we... I'm just going to state facts. So, like, everything just felt off. As soon as we woke up, it was raining. We were able to get our brisket on and all that good stuff, whatever. All that went pretty smooth. We went to wrap our burn-ins. That went smooth as well. Then we went to go wrap our brisket. We dropped the brisket. No, we were uh, we were injecting our chicken. Oh, and, yeah. And uh, we went to put a cutting board underneath in the corner of it. We had our bowl of our liquids for the brisket wrap. Yeah. And uh, the tipped corner it tipped it, it, pushed it against the side of the uh, wall and tipped, tipped it Tipped it over. And then well, there went all of our brisket liquid that's going to go inside of our wrap. All over the floor, all over everything. <laughs> and to be honest, I was just like, oh my gosh. Yeah. We had no extra ingredients for our liquids. And I felt my heart sink pretty much. I was like, dude, what are we going to do? <laughs> like in my head, I was like, okay, I'm about to mix water and like play bowl and hopefully get a little bit of like a beef broth made. And then I'm going to throw butter in there and just pray for the best. <laughs> like literally, that's what I, I know, was. I know. And it was a huge brisk. Well, huge compared to what we normally cook. Yeah. So it's like. Yeah. And again, it was just wild. It was just like, I was just like, dude, there's no way that yeah. this just happened. It was raining. It was windy. It was kind of cold. Like, yeah. And then just- we were kind of right in the middle of getting ready to wrap pork and getting ready to wrap ribs. But then like you also needed to leave to go get stuff for the brisket. So we were kind of like, okay, how, like, how are we going to navigate this? So we ended up calling an audible, which eh, I don't think it really made that huge of a difference, but I do think maybe that, I don't know. We ended up putting the, the pork and the ribs in the cambro because we weren't sure what to do. We put the pork and the ribs in the cambro for like 45 minutes before wrapping them because you left and you were trying to get back into the contest And they wouldn't let you back into the contest. So, like, I had to walk over there and I was like, hey, this is my wife. We're we're competing, you know. Our setup's right there. Like, you can literally see our setup, like, 20 yards right there. Oh, yeah. And they just would not let us in. And we understand. They were doing their job. It it is what it is. But the situation was just like, dude. So, then I'm trying to get in touch with the promoter, seeing if we can get some help, which, shout out to the promoter. He did help us out. But, overall, everything took a while. So our, our pork and stuff was just sitting there for like 45 minutes in the camera. Oh, yeah. And it just, the temps just dropped drastically. So we're like, oh, man. And I don't know if that's going to be in the video. I don't really think it will be. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it will be, is what you're saying? Yeah, parts of it, yeah. Okay. So it just, did you get the part where all the stuff spilled in the oh, video? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the camera's right on there. Yeah, you can <laughs> edit out the bad words that we were saying. The expletives. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, it, it just... It felt weird. The contest felt weird. It, it really did feel like kind of nothing was going our way. Again, there's no excuse. Oh shoot! We yeah. made the mistake of spilling that. After that, I was dropping all sorts of stuff outside. I was yeah. dropping thermopens and chicken lids and <laughs> chickens. <laughs> yeah. So that's the other thing. And here's the thing: I'm not gonna ever sit here, like, you know how I am. But typically when I get, like, flustered and mad, it's something I did, right? Like, I never, I try my best to never get mad at you for something. Like, I walked outside and I was like, dude, Sabrina just dropped the brisket. I mean, uh, the chicken. And he was just like, what the heck? Like, not Sabrina. She's usually always on point. I was like, yeah. I was like, it's not a big deal, though. Like, I don't want her to feel, you know, like, I was having a conversation with my dad. And I was like, I don't want her to feel, like, crap, which 
I know she does. Oh, I, well, I did until we went back inside and I actually looked at it. And I was like, oh, yeah, I mean, the, the bird looks okay. It's just the box that didn't. Yeah. So we tried to fix that up as best as we could. Yeah, it didn't but, look that great. But but what happened was, you know, we had our carrying case and it's cool. It's rainy. We're trying to keep it safe. And you get one hand in the handle and you try to get the other part of the, the strap over and it just missed. And yeah, it's tilted and. Man, it is what it is. Yeah, you know, the one thing I will say is no matter what competition, we know that things don't always go smoothly. Yeah. And at the end of the day, even if we didn't win, I always like to uh, – it creates a memory. Yeah, You know, for we sure. look back and there's a story to it. There's a memory to it. We for look sure. back on it. Um, so, I, I, of course, in the moment, it's like, dang. But, like, that's not good. But, but as weird back, as it sounds – I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. You look back and and you, it's something to kind of laugh at later. Like, I just freaking dropped that chicken. But at the same time, and I genuinely mean this, you can tell me if you disagree. I did feel like in the moment, although like obviously we were like, oh my gosh, like we didn't freak out. No, we, even yeah. we made those decisions pretty quick. We're like, all right, let's just go ahead and put it in the cam, bro. We don't know what else to do. I got to go help Sabrina try and get back in this contest. Yeah, I didn't have time to go wrap the ribs in the injection and all that with i'm sorry not the injection with the rib wrap and all that stuff in the butter i didn't have time to do it yeah i was trying to help you get back into the contest so i'm like all right well i'm just gonna throw them in the camera like it's not like we contemplated it for 45 minutes and we didn't know what to do like no we made these decisions yeah, pretty quick, quick. and although it may have hurt us i mean what else were we gonna do it was just a weird situation it was a really weird situation but overall like you said and i agree with you Every single contest is a memory. I got to spend time with my dad, even though my dad, and I know he's going to listen to this, me and my dad are exactly alike. So I feel like we butt heads a lot. And he likes to mess with me because he knows it's going to like frustrate me. But what did I tell you last con- uh, last contest, last podcast? I do that to you. Yeah. And I also do that to my dad. Yeah. My dad and I do it to each other yeah. on purpose. He he probably won't admit it, but my dad and I 100% mess with each other, and he'll he will he'll poke at that exact thing that he knows is gonna upset me, and he'll do it over and over and over, and then he just he just laughs and he loves it. <laughs> it's just the same way that I do it to you, or that I do it to him. Yeah, but the 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 difference though is I like fall right into it, and then I get like flustered yeah me like, I'll, i just give know? it right back to and him. then yeah y'all go back and forth and i'll turn around I'm like what are they talking about <laughs> like just like, <laughs> like the me, most ridiculous back and forth i'm like oh what's yeah what's going on what my are- my dad will literally be like oh did you see did you see that tiger that ran across the <laughs> did you see that tiger that that ran across the barbecue competition and stole that guy's brisket and you're mad to hear brisket stuff drop but his brisket's gone and i was like yeah dude i actually did yeah. see that tiger like that is insane like, in the at the end of the day the tiger also jumped into the other person's con you know thing and got their chickens and that tiger's just getting all the meats he's like yeah you really need to watch out because the tiger's coming over here <laughs> yeah. next i'm like yeah no i already told him to go away like and we just go back and forth yeah and we can do it for like five minutes and even me like you and my mom and my sisters are oh, like we love it you're like what are like what is wrong with these two <laughs> but we that's what we do we just mess yep. with each other but man I, I can tell you one thing and you know how much i love my mom and my dad man being with dad is just badass there's nothing like it even though even though we're just always at each other like that dude would just do anything for us oh and I, he was even like i thought you were gonna say for the thing that you know annoys me the most is my father-in-law at the competitions. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's, no, that's the, the best, best part. part. That is it's the, the best absolute, part. absolutely the best part. hundred percent. It's, it's knowing that somebody gives cares enough about you to drop everything to go with you when they don't have to. Dad literally chooses to come to the competitions with us and because he does so much for us. Oh, he does so much for us. He washes the dishes. He cooks us dinner. He cooks us breakfast mm-hmm. and he's having a blast out there. Yeah. And I just love it. I love being with dad. So that's memories for me and my dad. Obviously, me, you, and the kids, you know. Yeah. We're sleeping in that little trailer on these blow-up mattresses. I'm like, dude, what are we doing? <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Like, I think on Saturday night, we, we were talking about it. all like, man, we need a TV. Yeah. We need a TV in here. Like, let's just watch a movie. We could be watching Shang-Chi or something. Like, oh, the kids love Shang-Chi. 
And man, at the end of the day, we were able to meet a couple of kids from high school that, that I don't even know how to explain how much that meant to me. I don't know how much it meant to you. I'm sure it meant yeah, a lot. There's, there's good cooks out there and they're excited. Yeah. To see. So, you. so I met some cooks, some young kids, boys and girls and their teachers and their parents, some of the parents from JB Alexander and from United South in Laredo. And you, you ever had that thing where you know someone, like out of the corner of your eye, you know someone's looking at you? Mm-hmm. I felt that, right? And I knew that, the, that they were coming up to me. I knew it. And they were asking me, they're like, hey, Alonso, we watch your videos. And so right away, I knew that that's where they knew us from. And they're like, hey, do you want to try a rib? So I tried two ribs from two of the boys. And I'm going to tell you right now, both of those ribs were outstanding. Outstanding. And I told those guys, I was like, man, these ribs are fire, man. Like, let's go. And the excitement that they felt or that it looks like they felt when I told them that, at that moment, I told myself and I promised, I made a promise that I will not take this for granted. Everything that we have, everything that we can do. Yeah, there's days I feel lazy. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. But I will not take for granted this platform that we have, whether big or small. I will never take for granted this platform. I will never let this get to me. And I will never think that I'm above anybody because I'm not. I'm a human being just like you, just like everybody else, just like those boys. And it was a blessing to meet them. We had a young girl that made some very delicious beans, came up and gave us some beans. They were delicious. Again, their teachers were awesome. We had the boys bring us over some brisket, killer brisket. They tasted our brisket, and they're like, dude, you're about to win brisket. <laughs> we end up getting 10th place, and then they come, and they're like, dude, oh, I thought your brisket was going to hit harder than that. Like, that thing was incredible. So shout out to you guys. Shout out to JB Alexander High School and United South High School. What you guys did for us that day, um, it meant the world. It really, really, really meant the world. I want to say thank you to you guys. And... I mean, they were telling us that they watch our videos mm-hmm. for practice. Yeah, the young for their girl, the second group that walked up, the young girl, that's what she was saying. She watched us in, in Kingsville. Yeah. And they watch our videos for practice, which that is incredible to me. Yeah. That is incredible to me. You just never know who you're reaching out to. Oh, for when sure. When we started this, that's not what we had in our minds. Yeah. But the fact that it's gotten there is just a blessing. And we will not take it for granted. And we will not let you guys down, no matter what. We can't promise we're going to be the largest YouTube channel in the world, but we can promise with what we've got, we're going to do the best that we got every single day. Shout out to those guys. That was the most important part of the contest. There were 77 teams. We got a 10th place brisket. I don't even remember the placings on everything else, but we got 16th overall out of 77. 14th rib. 14th rib, yeah. 12th or 14th rib, something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, 28th 28th, chicken? I thought it was 28th pork and 31st chicken or vice versa. Yeah, I don't know. It was something along those lines. Nothing crazy, mm-hmm. nothing great. Um, it's okay. Let's move on to the next one. It is what it is. We're competing again this weekend in Ingleside. That's where you went to high school. So it is um, it is what it is. You know, we just, we just know that it's it's here, right? It's in our heads. Yes, there's a very, very good possibility we didn't make the best barbecue we could have, but it's because it's we're up here too much. Let's just go cook. This weekend, we're going to go cook. We're going to have fun, and I look forward to it. And for the past three weekends, or I'm sorry, the past two weekends, I don't know why I've felt really stressed leading up to the contest. Like, even right after the contest, I'm like, oh, here comes another one. And I'm like, nervous. I don't feel like that this week. I feel excited to go. And I think that... Well, shoot, we just, we only got to drive 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, why. Maybe, but I just feel excited to go, and I'm really, really, really looking forward to it. I hope I'm going to see some friends. And if we win, we win. If we don't, we don't. It is what it is. We're going to be hanging out with the kids again. We get to see Dad again. Hopefully my sister comes. Uh, multiple sisters come. But, yeah. So, we have a pretty long interview for you guys. You think we should just roll right into that? Yeah. Was there anything else we needed to talk about before we get the pit king on the podcast? Nothing 
Nothing, Nothing as cool as uh, our guest. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, without further ado, let's go ahead and roll right into our interview with the Pit King Laredo 2023 champion. And, well, speaking of Pit Kings, today our guest is the Pit King. So, if you guys live under a rock, you may not know who this man is, but just in case you do not know, can you tell us your name, team name, man, where are you from? I'm Phil Breeden, uh, founder and owner of LC Barbecue from Bandera, Texas. Yep. The Phil Breeden on the podcast. We're extremely excited to have him. Man, so I do want to get right into it. We just competed this past weekend in Laredo, Texas at the Pit Kings 2023, and you won it. And it was it was a pretty epic win from our point of view, from everybody that competes around you and we're watching. We're all watching one thing, and you know what we're watching. We're watching that points chase. We're seeing who's going to yeah. win the end of the year, and it's really, really close right now. And everybody kind of knew this is one of those ones that if you were going to win, it was going to be a huge help for your points chase. So, I mean, man, how do you feel the cook went? Obviously, you won. But, I mean, what was Laredo like for you? Um, you know, I had a I had a pretty normal cook. You know, I look at things like I get asked every single weekend after we turn in how, how my cook went. And I typically tell them, man, we'll find out in a little bit of the words. It's typically what I tell them because <laughs> – and it normally goes about the same every week in and out for the most part. You know, I mean, I normally turn in exactly what I, what I want to turn in week in and week out. Um, Laredo was no different, man. I had a good cook, no issues, turned in what I want to. And, you know, that being said, we can do that every single time. And I think that's the most frustrating part about competition barbecue is, I mean, we all think our stuff is like the greatest, right? And we mm-hmm. should win all the time. But when you do exactly what you want, like it was easy and man, no hiccups, Man, and then you get then you get it handed to you. It's pretty frustrating, right? So it's easy to kind of get in that spiral of get lost. It's I say the hardest thing to do in competition barbecue is turn in good 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 barbecue, get it handed to you, and be able to do the same thing again the next week, right? Um, you know, the chicken <coughs> cost me a contest last week. Um, man, where were we at? Poteet, I think. Mm-hmm. You know, I had twenty first chicken. I think there was like forty six teams or something, and Man, I needed a better chicken, but I really like my chicken. And I told Carmen that. I'm like, man, I turn that in every time. So I go down to Laredo, I cook the same chicken and turn it in and hit second place. So, yeah, man, that's just – I think that comes from, like, a lot of years of experience and knowing that, man, just every day is not going to be your day. And you just kind of got to keep chipping away and almost, like, wait your turn. They drop when they drop, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, they seem to drop a lot Almost every you. weekend <laughs> you have – we all have barbecue that can win a contest week in and week out, but you know, you're just not only one person's going to win every contest and there's a lot of good people cooking. So be impatient and, you know, um, just taking them when they drop. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said a second ago, yours drop a lot. You win, (laughs) you win a lot. And, um, I mean, from, from my point of view, some of the things that you just said are things that I definitely as a newer cook can work on. So we were blessed enough to hit two back-to-back GCs and then, I think we really started overthinking things because in my head, I was kind of like, man, you know, I think people are kind of looking at us now. They want to see what we're going to do. I got to, I got to, I got to get these ribs a little more tasty. I got to get them a little more tender (laughs) because I got to go three in a row. Otherwise people are going to think we're really not that good. And you kind of start to play with yourself up here. And it's kind of like one of those things you said, you know, in Poteet, I actually thought you won Poteet because you had two, you had a first place brisket your pork was a high call and you had a third place rib, right? Or something like that. Um, man, let me think back. I can't remember. <laughs> they all run together. Yeah, anymore. I'm, I'm I had sure. first place brisket, you know, I didn't walk in chicken, but you know, in my mind, I thought my chicken was good. Yeah. Um, man, I, I had myself pegged somewhere between first and fifth. I even told Carmen, I'm like, man, we could have GC it. No, I think first and seventh is kind of where I had, you know, six or seven. I said, it's all going to come down to kind of how these calls play out in cumulative. You just never know. Mm-hmm. If somebody don't have four calls, man, they could get dead last in a meet and not make the top 10. It, it, it can happen. Yep. Um, in Poteet, man, there was a lot of like people had a chance at it. You had Smoking Onions, Tom and them who ended up winning it. And I think he had like a first and a second or two really big ones. And then like he had three solid calls. 
And there was another team um, that had three solid calls. I, I guess I had three calls. Man, yeah. there was a lot with two. They, they, I had six or seven teams that – nope. Uh, only one that had four was Louie, you know, uh, D.D. Mm-hmm. And his were not taking anything away. I think they were like six, eight, nine, ten. They were yeah, not first, second. I don't think you got any real, real hammers in there. But then again, he had four calls. So yeah. – um, that's just the way it played out. And it was tight at the top and, and you just kind of never know you're sitting there and, and you just don't know what that other meat is. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I kind of, I guess in my head, I was thinking, man, I think, I think Phil was probably there between that 10 and 15 mark. So he still has a really good shot, but you know, like you said, accumulative, it's, it's a little bit crazy. You don't really know. It's just going to play out how it plays out. Now, one of the things that when we, I know about you a little bit, but we found out a little bit more about you when we started doing a little research, right? So you've been competing since 2015. So you, in a, in a way, my wife and I were talking about this. It seems like a long time, but it's really not a long time, right? So I think that it almost feels like, man, the way Phil's dominating, he's got to have been cooking for 25 years, right? right? Or something like that. So, I mean, you started in IBCA, now you're doing mostly CBAs, but you, you compete in all sanctioning bodies. What do you think over the past eight, almost nine years competing has helped you be one of the most consistent cooks in the States? Because when we look back, you were number four overall 2018 IBCA, number four overall 2019, number one 2020. You won Cook of the Year last year, and right now you're in the running again for Cook of the Year. Um, you know, 20, I started cooking in 2015, you know, I think I did eight or 10 cook-offs that year, 16, same thing, you know, 10 or 12, 17, 10 or 12. And then in 18 is when I really started cooking, you know, like a lot, you know, you talk about, I've been doing this for eight, nine years, whatever, man, if if you do it by cook-off count, it is 25 years. I've done 327 cook-offs and man, there's, people been cooking for 30 years that haven't done 327 cook-offs. So starting in 2018, we started cooking every weekend and I did 50 that year. I did 50 and 19, you know, 20 was, um, you know, COVID and all that. So they shut down most of the country. I still did 35 and 20. Um, I think I did 50, 51 or 52 and 21. And then last year I did 50. So I do 50 cook-offs a year. Um, man, cooking that often, man, I stay pretty in tune with what I'm doing. Right. And I mean, it's hard to forget week to week when you're (laughs) cooking every, you know, it's, you know, kind of like, you know, I don't want to say riding a bike, but man, you you just, we only cook once a month. I know that when I take a week off or there's a week off or two, you know, normally when you get into December, there, there might be a couple of weeks where you don't cook, man, that first one out, (laughs) I'm normally not as sharp as I was week to week to week to week. So obviously cooking a lot. And just running my program week in and week out really helps me kind of, to me, be in tune with what's going on in barbecue. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that um, you mentioned on it, I've cooked, and I don't know how many in all sanctioning bodies since I started, but, you know, obviously tons of IBCA. um, And 2020, I did 40 KCBS. So, you know, I've probably done maybe 60 KCBS in my career. So, Man, I would say that in 21, cooking all those KCBS, man, it makes you a better cook, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I had to learn a lot about how I cook and then cook into a a, a trained judge, you know, someone that KCBS has certified judges. So now you have a, you know, you have a a script of what they're looking for. So things are a little different. Tenderness is different. So I think each sanctioning body has its own maybe set of challenges or pros and cons or makes cooks better towards those or not. So doing all the different ones, man, you kind of, you learn all those nuances, right. And it just kind of expands your game. So when I came back after 21 of doing a a ton of KCBS, you know, came back and started cooking in Texas, man, I learned a lot cooking KCBS food and applied a lot of that to Texas barbecued man, turns out Texas people like it a lot, you know, some of that stuff. So not all of it, but you know what I mean? Um, And the bag of tricks just gets a little bigger. For sure. And how do you think you're able to be so successful in the all different sanctioning bodies and in all areas, like not just Texas? I mean, Texas is a big place and there's a lot of different styles of food people like in Texas. But yeah, I mean, even out of state, you're doing well. 
Yeah. Um, you know, my barbecue doesn't really change number, you know, I don't, doesn't matter if I'm in Kansas city or, um, Yuma, Arizona or North Carolina, Montana. I mean, I've cooked in all those places and I'm cooking the same barbecue. I'm cooking the same thing. I'm cooking, turning in in Texas all the time for the most part. I mean, we might make small tweaks or this or that. I would say if anything, man, I could probably be more honed in on regional barbecue. And when we talk about that, mainly KCBS, because man, I do think there is a difference between Georgia and Kansas city. Mm -hmm. And that can be two different profiles, right? I'm not saying a Kansas city team can't win in Georgia. And I'm not saying a Georgia team can't win in Kansas city, but man, I think if you're just like a lot of those KCBS guys that have been doing it for 10 or 15 years, um, they know the differences in those areas and what adjustments that might make. And man, there's some from Kansas city that go, man, I'm not going to Georgia ever again, you know? So they just know to stay away from that because their profile don't fit it. So man, they have tons of experience, right. And where I've got a year, year or two's worth in that, in that world. So hopefully, man, I'd love um, when diesel's not $5 a gallon and, you know, <laughs> a box of cereal in 10 bucks, like right. maybe down the road, I, I want to go cook in different states again and do another run at KCBS just because I enjoy it. You know, it's you know these days it's kind of like man, I'm looking for challenges. They kind of pick me more often than I pick them, but you know, it's kind of always got to have a carrot to chase type deal. You know, a challenge set in front of you that um, you want to conquer. That's kind of what gets me going. And I think that that's really cool that you said the challenges pick you because I can tell you one thing that we do is we hope that we're, I'm going to be honest, we hope that we're finding you out there. And the reason I, I want that is because I want to cook against the best people. I can't challenge myself if I'm going to cooking against a bunch of, you know, 10-year-olds, right? I want to cook against the best. I'm hoping that you and Bill and a lot of those other guys are there, and I'm hoping that I can one day, hey, man, and Alonzo's here. He's cooking good. You never know what's going to happen today, right? So I think that that's a really cool way that you look at it. And one of the things that I kind of wanted to talk about also is you mentioned a little bit about judging. So KCBS, they have trained judges. Here in Texas, we do not. Now, one of the things that I hear from a lot of people and a lot of competitors and a lot of competitors that do great, sometimes they're a little upset with the judges, right? Oh, uh, the judging was, it was just bad at this event or bad at that event. And I'll be honest with you, I've been one to say it too, Okay. Man, I don't think we're human if we, if, I mean, we've all had those thoughts, right? Yeah. I mean, just some people have them more than others. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think that the interesting thing is when I first started doing competition barbecue this year, I got really into it. My first couple of events, I, in my head, almost thought like, man, this is, this is almost rigged. There's no way my barbecue is <laughs> good, you know, and over time you learn very quickly that that isn't true. And one of the reasons that I think that it isn't true is because look at the people that are consistently in the top. It's the same people. You're up there. Kevin's up there. Aaron Leslie's up there. Bill Purvis is up there. So, you know, the, the judging thing, while it's an interesting take, I think that good barbecue is going to be good barbecue, and wherever you take it, it's going to hit. You know, I mean, if you, if you cook good barbecue, people know that it's good barbecue. I think that the judges, of course, some of them can be a little wonky. But, man, for the most part, I think people like you are proving that Judges just want that good food. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Good barbecue is good barbecue, and you can put as long as you can put good barbecue in front of somebody, man, it should be appreciated. Um, another another way I think in the thought process is, um, man, you definitely don't want to give them anything negative about what you put in front of them, right? Like mm -hmm. it might not be the best thing they ever ate, but you don't want to give them any reason to think that there was something wrong with it, whether it was too sweet or too salty or, you know, too saucy. I say stay away from the TOOs. And in a cumulative system, and sometimes it's not winning the contest, it's not losing it, you know. If you if you blow a meat, you're done. Yep. So um, you got to be careful of uh, trying to please them too much. And it's inherent in us when we don't win to make our barbecue better. Like we want to fix whatever it was, like, you know, you can take, for example, like um, Poteet, and I had a 21st chicken. It, it's inherent to go, man, what did I do? I mean, obviously, they didn't like it. It cost me the contest. What I do next week to do it? You know, and, and it's the difference of knowing, man, just take your lumps. It is what it is. Who knows? I mean, there's two judges on the sheet that, man, you didn't get by. You got a drop score, and you didn't get by the other, and it is what it is. But, 
man, I tasted it. It was really good. I'm going to cook it again next week. After a certain amount of time, you can't beat your head against the wall if that's five weeks later and it's the same thing. Obviously, <laughs> you ain't on the same wavelength as the judges, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, knowing when to tweak and when not to tweak is big. And, man, I'll, I'll say this. I'm sure I'll never – feel different about what I say when the hardest thing in competition barbecue is cooking really good barbecue and being able to turn in the same thing next week when you got it handed to you this week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what gets most people spiraling into left field. That's what I call it. You know, like, man, they just had this random cook off. They hit some bad tables and the next week they're doing something totally different because man, it, they didn't get the results they wanted. And then the next week, man, they, they didn't turn in as good a barbecue. So then you're going in the wrong direction. And Four or five weeks later after that, man, you can't remember where you were at six weeks ago. Yep. So then you're kind of in that death spiral, and it's super hard to get out of those. I mean, <laughs> you know, think back over the eight or nine years I've been doing it. You see people okay, – I've been fortunate. I really haven't felt fallen into that. Now, it always seems like there's a meat that we need to kind of make stronger. Like, I'm, man, I want top five meats. If I don't have a meat that's consistently in the top five, man, I'm, I'm working on that meat. You know, if it's hitting seventh or eighth or ninth or tenth, man, it's just – You'll get away with that at some contests, but at others you won't. So, man, I'm always striving for top five meets and tweaking my way up there, like, hopefully. But, man, over the years, man, we've had chicken runs. We've had rib runs, pork. I mean, we've done – it kind of depends on the year. Like, obviously, this year is probably brisket. You know I mean? It's yeah. done pretty good. <laughs> um, yeah, it's done uh, Compared good. to golf, you know, I mean, for the golfers out there, Man, you know, you have that day you're driving the ball 350 yards down the middle of the fairway and you can't make a putt to save your life. You know what I mean? Or, man, you're making every putt, but, man, you can't chip. You know, so it's rare in a game of golf as amateurs that you put around together where you could drive the ball, you could hit your irons, you could chip and you could putt, and then you had that, that 69 on the scorecard or whatever. And competition barbecues a lot. I mean, look at the people that hit three meets and then, boom, you tank a meet and you don't win the contest. So – I make those analogies a lot of times that it seems to be similar to that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And and it's funny. I, I kind of laugh as you're saying those things because some of them are applying to us <laughs> right now. So we didn't get that third one in a row and we're like, oh my God, like uh, the brisket sucked or this or that or whatever. So like our let's, chicken. Our chicken. And then in Laredo, dude, you would laugh if you knew what we did the contest before compared to Laredo, you would laugh at us. You'd be like, Alonzo, relax, bro. Because when I tell when I tell you calm down, man, it was good. What are you doing? When I, when I tell you, I changed pretty much everything. I did because it messed with my head. It really did because I'm like, man, how do I win two in a row? And then I just go and go get my butt whooped in Poteet. But at the same time, like you got to think about it, man. There was a lot of great cooks in Poteet. It just kind of is what it is. But just to, yeah. to circle back to you said that you had runs and you mentioned a brisket, so. Over the past eight contests, we looked at your results in brisket. You've got five first places, a second place, a third place, and then one eighth place over your past eight contests. Have you ever had a protein that has hit quite this hard? Because it's funny. The past couple of events that we've been at, we we know you're there, obviously, and um, the wife and I look at each other as brisket's getting called down. We're like, oh, well... Phil won again. You know, I mean, it just feels like you're going to go and win every brisket right now. And I, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy to see from the outside looking in. I can promise you, everybody that I talk to that's on the circuit, they're saying the same thing. They're like, dude, what is this guy doing with his brisket? Like, is he cooking a fat side up? Oh, you know, old school brisket? <laughs> I mean, I know the answer is no, but, you know, it's just, have you ever had anything that has hit this hard? Man, I, I probably wouldn't say, yeah, probably not. You know, I mean, I've had, I know early on, you know, I had pretty good chicken runs. I did really well for the first couple of years in chicken once I figured out chicken. You know, I mean, I created foul play and didn't release it for a couple of years. So, man, I had similar runs back in the day with, with chicken. But once I released foul play, man, my chicken got a lot more average, <laughs> you know, I mean, you had a lot of people all this, you know, running foul play. So it just wasn't as easy to win when you turn in, you know, Same you got a 40 team contest and 25 of them are foul play, man, it's a little harder to win. So, um, that was a good run back in the day, but no, I can't think of another run that was maybe quite as hot as 
the brisket's been this year. You know, me, I'm just like week in and week out. Don't change a thing. That's all I can think. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, you told me in Poti you, you're going to ride. I've done enough ball. competition to know that every good streak comes to an end. So, man, we're just going to ride this one till the wheels fall off. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and you think that's what helps you to be so consistent is that you just try not to change anything? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Just kind of the way the brisket's been, like when you recap that, what'd you say, eight cook-offs, five first, a second, <laughs> third, and eighth or something like that? Yeah. Um, when it gets that kind of ridiculous, then it, like the superstitions come into play. But right. in general, um, and when I talk about these things and my thoughts and what I think about all this stuff, man, a lot of that stuff's been formulated because, um, man, I've been cooking for eight or nine years, but it's 327 contests. So, man, there is a lot of experience in there. And, man, I've thought these things. I've felt these things. I've had the pressure of, man, I had two GCs. I'm going for three in a row and and failed that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have every scenario, but man, a lot of them have, I've been in those shoes. I've had those thought processes. I've had to struggle with, you know, why was my barbecue not good enough to win that weekend? And, you know, just experience has taught me that, man, it, it just ain't your fault sometimes. And there's just absolutely nothing you can do about it. Right. If, if um, man in CBA, <laughs> I'll log in every week and look at, my tables, you know, I look at other people's tables. I look at table averages, man. I studied this stuff pretty, you know, fairly intensely. Uh, KCBS is the same way. There's a lot of data in there that you can kind of break down and, you know, kind of, to me, it's all about making it make sense in your brain. If it can make sense to you, then man, you kind of know what you need to do next week. Like, man, forget about it and don't worry about it. It is what it is. Or, Mm -hmm you know, really analyze your stuff and go, man, you're getting three scores. So you're getting a, an appearance, a taste and a tenderness. And man, I always break those down by categories and look for any consistencies. Like, man, is taste getting me, is tenderness getting me, you know, when I don't have the results I want, man, I'm looking at that really hard and trying to find some piece of some nugget of information that tells me what mark I'm missing. And when we talk about these marks, missing marks, um, Man, it, competition barbecue is so strong out there these days compared to when I first started. Man, I felt I would always feel like if it's a 50-team contest, man, maybe 15 people could win. Now if it's a 50-team contest, man, I feel like 40 people can win, right? So I just think the difference between GC and dead last has shrunk um, over the eight or nine years that I've been doing this. You know, the, the bad teams are better. And the good teams are even better, but but the range has shrunk to where there's a slimmer margin between uh, who's winning and who's not winning. And there's a ton of data. You know, there's there's the internet, right? It's endless. You the information you can get off the internet between social media and YouTube, and then the classes. Man, these people won't quit teaching these classes. Man, they keep making it harder. <laughs> yeah, I was going to mention the classes because you say that that everyone's gotten a lot better. Well. I mean, like you yourself, you give classes. I know you gave maybe one or two this year, right? Yeah, so we did three classes this year. We did one in January, one in February, and and one in May. Okay. And I think we did three classes last year, too. The past several years, it's been about three classes a year, roughly. So So if people are obviously looking to learn from one of the best cooks in the United States right now, you will be offering those hopefully next year, and you usually put that out on your social media, right, when you're going to have them? Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, I, I do this for a living. This is what we do. LC barbecue is, is, is how we pay the bills and incorporated with that obviously is, you know, we have a lot of rubs and injections and I teach classes, you know, I go to competitions and I have my expenses and I win money. So hopefully, you know, the goal is that be, <laughs> for that to be more than I spend. Right. Yep. Um, so you add all that together and, and that's how we make the lights come on day in and day out. Um, man, hopefully down the way, I mean, I just assume not teach classes, you know, um, it makes it way harder for me to win when, you know, I teach roughly 50 people a year, exactly what I do. Um, man, it it doesn't make it easier to win. (laughs) You're you're just, you're just fighting against you all over the place now. (laughs) Yeah. You know, but that at the same time makes me, you know, that's another one of the the challenges I have is like, man, I'm going to go tell 50 people exactly what I'm doing and then I'm going to beat them. Yep. You know, so yep. 
Um, at first, when I started doing classes, I think I did the first class in 2018, maybe. So what is that, five years we've been doing classes? And, you know, my vision of classes at first was like, you know, I'm going to tell everybody what I'm doing and then they're going to do it and then they're going to beat me. Well, over the years, man, I've learned you can teach, man, it's only maybe about 10% in the retention part. I don't mean the retention. That's probably wrong. Man, most people come take your class and they either try to fix what they think you're doing wrong or they run it one time or two and they give up on it pretty quick or, man, they never run it at all. I've seen all those scenarios and maybe about 10% of the people I've taught really apply it. And like, you can just see it all clicking and they're kicking ass out there and they get it right. Yeah. But, and it's just surprising to me. I've given a class. I've gone the next week into a cook-off. I've seen people at my class shook their hand and man, they'll have a pop-up in a table and not one LC product on there. And I'm like, man, that's not the class I taught. Yeah. You just spent a lot of money to, well, why'd you even come? Yeah. But Man, it doesn't bother me anymore. I mean, I'm I'm there. I'm I'm telling everybody exactly what I'm doing. I'm trying to give them all the information I can to make them better. I, I take my classes super serious. Um, man, it is they're they're not cheap, and I want everybody that ever ever has come take my class to leave going, wow, it was a great class, you know, because um, that's what I'm trying to turn out. So you just mentioned that this is what you do. LC is what keeps the lights on. You mentioned your products, right? So. Yeah. You have a large line of products. You have injections, you have rubs, you have a brine. Now, for for us personally, we are using, I mean, we're using your pork injections, we're using your beef injections, we're using your phosphates, we're using hen drench. I mean, we're using everything, right? Now, these products that you came up with, did you did you come up with all of these and like test them for a long time before you put them into production? And how do you kind of come up with these products? Because every single one of them that we've tasted is just out of this world. Incredibly good. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate the kind words. Um, I'll give you the, the quick backdrop on it. You know, our, uh, 2018, uh, let me go back just a shortly back. I started in 2015, my team name was Lucky Charms. I competed as Lucky Charms um, for four or five years. And in 2018, I mentioned foul play and that chicken injection I had had come up with. Well, in 2018, I figured out, like, I had this idea. I'm like, man, I should, like, have a product and sell it. Like, this chicken injection is really good, right? Which, <laughs> man, I was doing good in chicken. <laughs> anyway, um, I figured out it was kind of intimidating because I had no idea how to get that product in a bag and with a label and nutritional information and, and sell it. But, you know, you start asking people and similar people in the industry and, you know, you just figure it out and, and we figured it out. So we released foul play and I didn't really have like grand, like I didn't have a plan at that time. I thought it was kind of cool to have a product and then like everybody liked it, like, and it did really well on the circuit and everybody used it. So I'm like, all right, this is really cool. Like this is working. So in my brain, I'm like, man, what's next? And man, I thought I should start working on a brisket injection. So that's what I did. And um, I've done this with all my products. Um, man, I've run them all, you know, there's no certain amount of time that I have on them, but most of them have been at least six months, if not 12 months that I've run them in competitions before I ever release them. Like, man, I've got so many that I thought were like really good but man, I couldn't get them to hit or they weren't consistent. And man, I shelved that item. Like, man, there's, a, there's just a lot of them. But if I couldn't win with it in competition, developing a competition project, uh, a, a competition product, how could I really expect? And it's hard for me to sell to you. Like, man, you're, this is great. You know, it's just talking shit. But if, if I go out there and win with it, man, it's easy to get behind my products and go, man, it's what I'm using. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? It, yeah. That's pretty good for me. <laughs> um, so that became, that became the theme of like my business plan is, man, I'm going to create, you know, after I play, play bull was my second product I dropped. That was a brisket injection. It was really, you know, really good. And then I started working on pork. I created boss hog uh, as they go down the, the line. Um, I circled back like a year later and released angry bull. Angry bull was, I've got two brisket injections. I get that question a lot. Why do you have two? Man, when I was developing the first one, I had I was torn between two really good products. And 
you know, I do get a little bored with myself sometimes doing the same thing week in and week out. And man, I just, it was an option, you know, um, play bull's got a little bit more going on. Angry bull's a little smoother. So I in general recommend play bull with like, you know, primes or choice briskets, you know, if you're trying to really punch it or whatever and Wagyu angry bull, that being said, man, I've been running play bull for like the past two years and I'm, you know, one of those years I cook mainly primes and now I've been cooking mainly Wagyu's for the past year or so. So, um, it's not inclusive, but it's general direction. And then, um, you know, we just kind of started developing the line after that fill in voids, um, of where we didn't have products. And man, I would take a, most of the products that I have is, man, if I'm going to use my entire product line, I've got to have a product line that gives me options throughout the cook to be able to use my entire product line. So I just started building upon products that worked to put together the entire product line to offer to someone, you know, I'm a realist. That being said, there's only 10,000 good products out there in competition barbecue. So man, the options are endless to the competition cook, which is great, man. I mean, there's shit piles of good products out there. Um, I'm just trying to pave a way to give people options with a quality product that consistently they could turn out good products week in and week out and give themselves a shot to win. Right. And is there any of your products that you feel you always go to each competition, like some that you use more than others? Uh, so maybe we're talking about our favorites. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, that's kind of a hard question because man, I'm, I made them all pretty specific. Um, to what I want to do between injections and, you know, we have phosphates now with Rainmaker. So they're all like very specifically designed for the purpose in my head and creation. But I will say, you know, it's kind of probably easier to answer that or what I do around the house when I cook, you know, man, I use a shit pile of hindrance. I use a lot of hindrance. Mm. Um, we brine, we brine chicken wing. We did that yesterday and in the morning I'll just mix up some hindrance, eyeball it throw some water in there and soak the wings for five or six hours. And man, I'm cooking wings in the afternoon. So it's quick and easy. I did the same thing with uh, Reed killed a deer the other day and we had tenderloin and backstrap that we, we soaked in hinge ranch. And then, man, I'd say last call, I really gravitate to last call, especially at the house, but man, it's just, man, with the sweet notes and the peppery and it doesn't get hot and it just compliments a lot of stuff. And I think big meats take it well. So um, I use a lot of last call, a lot of hinge ranch, raw hide. It's pretty endless. You know, Carmen uses it in almost every meal she cooks. Uh, it's a base on all my meats. Um, yeah, those are probably like my top three usage wise. Yeah. Um, hinge ranch being so versatile, you know, it can be a brine, it can be a seasoning, man, it can be a finishing dust. So that's great for people to know because your products aren't just good for a competition. I and mean, we go through the same thing too. Like our stuff isn't just good for barbecue. I mean, we use it in the house all the time for anything. And, yeah. I, and I also like how you mentioned earlier, like the play bull and the angry bull. It's not inclusive. You can have fun with it. I'm not saying this is what I do, but well, maybe I am saying what this is what I do, but <laughs> you know, you can use, you can use a brisket injection in your pork or in your chicken or in your ribs or something like that. And vice versa. Just play around with the flavors. Just because it says foul play doesn't necessarily mean you can only use it on chicken. So I think that's the funnest part about all the products and and really being able to experiment at the house and do what you do out there is that you can really, you can make things your own, right? It's your product, but you can make it your own the way you use it. And 100%. speaking of your products, do you have anything right now that, that's in the works? I mean, the, the biggest thing that... I've heard you talk about it a little bit, but I want an LC barbecue sauce. That's that's what I'm looking for. I think you probably get that a lot, I'm sure. Yeah, um, that has been our, our major shift in focus um, late last year, and, and we've worked on it this year. It's, man, I would say it's far beyond, far behind the pace that I would like it to be at, but, man, I don't really put time restraints on any products that I do, so – Man, it'll be ready when it's ready. I, I was kind of hoping sometime this year we would have a sauce out. You know, we've got ideas for a couple sauces and a glaze or two. So, man, I don't know that that'll be an extensive line between sauces and glazes, but, you know, three or four products is in my mind the end goal. And, man, it's really creating what I kind of do in competition barbecue because, 
man, if I'm going to drop something like that, you can bet your ass that's what I'm going to be using on the circuit. So, man, I'm not going to drop it till I'm 100%. For sure. Man, I'm going to be running that sauce for the next 20 years. You better like it. Yeah. So, And I respect, um, I respect that a lot because – Well, I mean, to me, I mean, I take it like it's a, it's a big deal to me, man. Like like my fear in, in LC Barbecue has always been – man, releasing a product that was unsuccessful or that I'm like, shit, I kind of screwed that one up. So, um, I mean, it is what it is, but I do go through a lot of effort and a lot of um, meticulous product review and and just tweaking to get something exactly where I want. And, man, that's just the standard I've lived by is, man, it, it, it don't get a label on it, don't go to the stores until, man, I'm, I have no problem telling anybody this is what I use or or whatever. So, Man, if it if it's gonna end up having an LC label on it, you you can bet that that's what I'm gonna be using. And it's not gonna get released until it's right. But yeah, sauce is in the works. So awesome. do, you, do you find sauces more challenging than seasonings? Cause we do. Um yeah. Um yeah, I guess so. And you know, honestly, extensively, I, it's not like I'm man, ten years ago I was just making barbecue sauces at the house. Over the years of me even cooking. I've only made a couple, so right. it's not. I wouldn't say my um, my strong forte anyway. Not that I can't lean on people who are really good at it to get to a product that that I believe in. So, um, man, we're we're working with some people who that's what they do on sauce, and uh, we'll eventually get it to where we want it standard wise. And uh, another question we had is because we always see your sons out there competing in the kids queue. So how does it feel and to And running around? Yeah. He he is an he's active. I'm like, dude, this dude's an athlete, dude. Yeah, every single contest, he's like out there playing football with some other kids or something, and he's like running them over, running faster than I'm like, dude, look at Reed. He's <laughs> he's wild. He's wild in the best way possible, man. I love seeing him out there. He's got a lot of energy. Yeah. <laughs> he's pretty ate up with football these days. That's his that's his gig right now. He's He's got plans to go to the NFL. Hey, if you don't know, so yeah. I, I believe it. I believe it. But how does it feel to watch him compete and kind of follow in your footsteps or share in that hobby? Because I mean, we take our kids to all the competitions, and it would be nice to maybe see them. Because I mean, our oldest likes to cook, but she's a little timid with the the whole grilling aspect or barbecuing aspect. But it's it's cool to share that hobby with them. Yeah, hundred um, percent. You know, my daughters are seventeen. They're soon to be eighteen, and you know, it's it's been a lot of years since they've done a kids' queue. But you know, when they were, I don't know, eight, nine, ten, twelve in that range, they used to do kids' queues. You know, three or four a year, or however many, and they did well over the years. And um, we just kind of let it happen organically um, with our kids. You know, do you want to or not? And it was never like, hey, I'm going to sign you up. You're going to go do this. So. Right. Um, obviously them doing well at it as a parent, I mean, you know, of course you're going to be proud and it's going to make you feel, I mean, it's better than when you win, you know? So yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's a given, but you know, I would just say that I've always taken the approach of man, make sure they have fun with it. You know, I always tell Reed, Hey, I want you to try hard. Uh, I want you to be a good sport. And we got that out of the way pretty early. You know, he, he might have won his first I don't know how many in a row and then one time he didn't and man the tears come and the big lip and all that mess and man bud you can suck it up real quick yeah man dad don't win every weekend and neither do you so what you are going to do is be a good sport you're going to go shake that kid's hand and tell him how good a job they did right so he does that he does a great job at that by the way he another kid wins I mean most of the time I will say I see Reed win but Another kid wins, man. He sprints up to them, gives them a high five and a hug, mm-hmm. like congrats. And I love that. And and obviously that comes from you and your wife, but I love seeing that from him. He is a very respectful kid when it comes to that. He is, but, you know, that's the expectations we put down on him, and that all stemmed from whatever instance that was years and years ago. I can't even remember, you know, but it happened, you know, yeah. and he was all busted up about not winning. And I'm like, man <laughs> – this sport's going to be rough on you if you, if you take <laughs> yeah. it that hard every time. Yeah. And, man, it was on me. My first year of cooking, man, I remember the, it was like my eighth cook-off the first time I didn't walk at a contest. And, man, I literally wanted to go, like, just get in the closet for a week and talk to nobody. <laughs> I mean, it was I mean, it was terrible. Yeah. I'm like, man, I, I can't deal with this. So <laughs> I had to go through the – I mean, winning's easy. Everybody's good winners, man. Everybody smiles when they hold up trophies, but – Man, not everybody's a good loser, and man, you can't really be a, a great winner until you learn how to lose. For sure, right? 
So we wanted to move into some questions. We did put out that we were going to have you on today. And uh, there was a few questions that we'd like to ask. And there was a couple of them that I thought were really good. So the number one question that we always ask everybody, it's something that we ask every single guest we have, is what is the most important tool or thing that you take to every single barbecue competition? These days, probably... um it, it, it could be so many things. It could be like 50 answers for me. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it really could. I, you know, I've been asked that question plenty of times and, you know, we all you know, go think thermopin or this or that, but um, I will say that the past almost two years um, I've re- relied heavily on and I will say taught myself a lot about electronics. You know, I'm, I'm a big Thermoworks fan um, I have the smoke 4X. I don't know how many smokes I have, but I've got a lot of, um, I've, I've got a lot of needles, thermal going. electronics yeah. to monitor at very accurate temperatures. And when I started that back in January of 22, you know, I mean, I've always like, we all check tenderness and probes and times, but man, I started running probes in meats and I don't have to do it like I did it then, but I can tell you when I started doing it then, my brain could not put together those three hours in the cook like it can now. And I can typically have a probe in one and close my eyes and guess where things are. I've done it so many times. So, man, you know, I'd I'd probably give it more to advice to anybody is, man, learn your electronics and learn, learn what meat does at certain temperatures. Um, It's taught me, it's probably improved my game over the past couple of years, you know, man, a couple notches just to just to have that soaked into my brain of what meat does at certain temperatures has helped me tremendously. Yeah, so one of the things that we've recently started doing about midway through the year is we started probing our brisket, our money muscles, our, you know, we, we started probing a lot of our stuff. And, uh, I mean, you're right. Just not even, all you got to do, is, even if you're curious, you just glance over and look at that little number and it tells you, hey, I still got time or I better get ready. You know, it, you can start prepping around that number and then uh, you can check for your tenderness. So I can agree with that for sure. Um, and yeah, I've walked by, I've walked by and I've seen that you've got, you know, you've got a bunch going on, but Hey, again, you know, that accuracy is there. Um, yeah. You know, I cook on my pit and I've, you know, it, it, when it comes to whatever, eight thirty nine o'clock, I've got all my, or without chicken, 10 o'clock, whatever time, Man, I've got all these meats on here. So, man, cooking a four meat event, you got money muscles, you got a butt, you got, you know, you got a flat, you got a point for burn ins, you got ribs, you got, and chicken got a lot going on. Man, it's hard in your mind to keep up with all those different temperatures. But, man, when it's sitting on a little screen right there staring at you, I plug them into the same spot every time so I don't get confused of which meat's which, right? And, um, man, it's just, kind of allows me to watch what's going on. I can say 211 is not 211. You know, if you get somebody go, hey, what do you cook your whatever it is, brisket to, and somebody says 211, eh, is it 211 on the front end or 211 on the back end? And they're like, what? <laughs> you know, so, yeah, um, man, it's going to sit at 211 for 40 minutes, right? Yeah. So, man, you hit it 211 when it turned 211, or has it been sitting there for 30 minutes tenderizing at 211? You know, it, it's not going to keep climbing at some point. So, if you're taking that random time and hitting a temp and did we just get there? Has it been sitting there? You know, it's that you don't have all the data. Right. For sure. Um, but when you sit there and watch them monitored, man, you, you can kind of put that picture together a little bit better. No doubt. So Jacob Kennedy asks, what separates your phosphates from others on the market? Um, there's a lot of good quality phosphates out there. I haven't always, you know, obviously had phosphates, but these are the phosphates that, have have been in foul play since the beginning. And to me, it's like, man, why don't I have my phosphates out there? It's a high quality phosphate. It's specifically di- designed for proteins, you know, as opposed to vegetables or, or seafood, you know, it's for big proteins designed to do its job that way. And, um, you know, I would say that, and I don't know that it's, leaps and bounds better than any of them, but I can stand behind that product that it's going to do what it says it does and, and add moisture retention and improve your tenderness on your meats. So, um, man, I just make sure it's a, it's a high quality phosphate designed for big proteins. Yeah. And we've been using them since you dropped them. 
So before you dropped them, as this is funny, we had no idea what phosphates were. Mm-hmm. Or, and then, I don't know if you remember, I actually reached out to you personally. And I said, hey, yeah. hey, Phil, name's Alonzo. I do YouTube, whatever. I wanted to do a video on phosphates because I had no idea what they were. And you actually broke it down to me exactly what they do. And then I was able to make a video on it. And then you actually told me, you're like, hey, just, just make sure people know that there's phosphates in foul play as well. So then I went back and kind of edited my, yeah. my comments and stuff. So that that happened early on when I first met you. So I think that's a, a pretty true testament to you not wanting to just sell something to somebody for, you know, for giggles. It was like, hey, make sure these people know that there is phosphates in foul play, but you boosted it with extra Rainmaker. Um, yeah. and, and since then... We we did we were able to tell the difference on that chicken right away when it came to the look of it the the flavor I mean I'm sorry not the flavor the texture the tenderness everything was just amazing compared was it like a million times better I wouldn't say that but it was better right yeah and you know that kind of circles back to when you ask what's my one thing I would want to contest or bring or this or that man it's the big picture to me it's putting those fifty steps together you know man you you can fumble on one or two or three of them out of so 47 out of 50 in our process as we get right it's the whole thing put together so Mm -hmm. you know that's the separation between you know coming in for gc at a contest these days or 15th place is those little bitty things those steps along the way that all add up to end product at, at the end of the day and our next question comes from curtis mcblain and he asked what was it that helped you become so consistent from when you first started in competition barbecue up until now? That's a good question, Curtis. Um, That's mullet I've shakers. Been... I'm sure you know that. That's mullet shakers barbecue. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Um, I, 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 I chased them all six-pack series, man. They were really came on this year, uh, cooking well, won a contest, got some reserves, man. Yeah, cooking really well. Um, but I would say that, you know, I'm, I've always had a passion for cooking my whole life. Um, I, I really didn't barbecue at all. You know, I would grill every now and then before I started um, in 2014. I think I cooked my first brisket in the fall of 2014, like in my life. Um, but having that passion for cooking, man, I just kind of rolled that straight into barbecue and started soaking it up like no different than anybody that just like is new to our sport. It's, it's pretty easy to get the, you know, get bit by the bug. Yeah. And I did. And man, then your brain just goes into total consume mode of, you know, so much stuff that matters and so much other stuff that don't end up mattering. Right. Sifting through all that to kind of like get where you are today. And man, my, I would say that, you know, having the mindset is that man, I, I, I don't think I'm there today. Like if I ever think, OK, this is it, then that's probably when it's going to probably end. So man, I'm always trying to be better at my craft and. um I'm very passionate about it. So, and maybe that's kind of what gives me the edge sometimes. I don't know. So this next question was asked about 15 times. <laughs> so I'm not going to put any specific person, but I will say that everybody wants to know what makes your brisket unbeatable. What's the secret in that brisket? How is his brisket always winning? The list goes on, man. I mean, I really don't know how to answer that <laughs> other than play bull, man. <laughs> <laughs> buy play bull. <laughs> Man, it's been a play bull, raw hide, last call brisket for a couple of years now. Like, you know, that's the core of, of the process. And there's nothing earth shattering. You know, I'm not putting truffles on it or anything like that. But, <laughs> yeah, um, man, I, I would say, man, I am cooking burn ins. I'm turning in burn ins. I, I feel like burn ins have given me an edge since the rule change. Um, man, I've turned them in every single contest since it changed to allow them in CBA on December 1st of um, – last year so right? yeah, yeah yeah so it's been almost a, a full year that we could turn in burn-ins in cba so man i do think i cook a good burn-in i do think that gives me an edge you know i'll well, say that i've tasted you know it, if i'm being it's, honest it's and putting you know yeah and if i'm being honest of, of what the answer to that question is man i would say that's what it is and you know back in 21 when i, man, I did 40k cbs contests and i would have won a lot more contests that year if i had figured out brisket you know i was you know, I struggled through brisket and KCBS. Just it, it, it took me probably longer than any meat and any sanctioned body since it, so I started to kind of finally get that. And and it, that's a direct result of where my brisket is today. Um, you know, late that year, I, 
man, there was like five or six contests that if I would have just had a, man, a decent brisket, I would have GC those contests and said, I'm sixth, seventh, eighth, you know, it's costing me contests. Well, man, I worked really hard on burn ins that year. And man, that, I think there was six contests towards the tail end of that year. Man, that's all I turned in was burn ins. I was turning in just burn ins every contest and winning contests doing that. So, you know, once fast forward two years later and CBA allows burn ins, man, I've cooked a lot of burn ins, you mm -hmm. know, and I took my lumps figuring out how to do it in KCBS and, you know, starting behind the eight ball from all these really good seasoned cooks that do it week in and week out for 10 or 15 years. And I'm just like, I want to try, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So uh, I would say that that helped me get prepared for that. Real quick. If you guys want to learn how to make those burn ins, don't forget Phil does offer classes and there will be posts um, sometime early next year, hopefully where you guys can learn how to make the burn ins. I've had one of his burn ins and it definitely made us think that, we got we got to do this too because if someone's biting this thing, they're they are thoroughly enjoying this bite. And I think that's been a big difference for us because we've always been okay with brisket, but when we switched over to CBA and we started doing good burn-ins, because at first we're like, ah, you know, if they're not too good, salty, right? If they're not good, we don't want to put them in the box, right? But yeah. I think we've gotten to a point where th we have to get those right because they're better. They really, truly are better. Yeah, than you slices. make a good burn in. It'll, it'll. Yeah, I think that you know, if you analyze that situation, you know, like you take IBCA or Lone Star, where they don't allow you to turn in burn ins. Man, I think that knocks my advantage down a couple notches because, man, if it's fifty team contest, man, there's going to be thirty teams there that can cook a really good brisket. You know, slices. Mm -hmm. If you take that same contest and you allow burn ins, man, now it ain't thirty. Now it's maybe. 10 or yeah. maybe five, you I know, was say um, 10, yeah, I think it's a low number. So, so, um, man, there's a lot of separation there when, and especially if people are turning in bad burn-ins, like that only helps me that much more. Right. right. Because mm -hmm. man, they look great. And it's a great idea until they eat one that's, you know, not to their liking and then like, Whoa. Right. And then, <laughs> you know, uh, I think that allows some separation too. For sure. Well, that was all the questions that we had for today from the fans. I want to say thank you for coming on the show, man. Uh, obviously, best of luck in the points chase here in the end of the year. I think it's literally going to come down to the last contest. You know, I mean, you and Kevin are just back and forth, back and man, forth. Man, it's back been and forth. fun. It, it's it's been fun. I have the you know I had the same basically the same experience last year. Man, I didn't really plan on chasing CBA Team of the Year last year, and um. Man, I, I just kind of got on a little roll, and next thing you know, you look at the state like, whoa, I, I might could. And like I said earlier, man, that picked me. Okay, well, maybe we'll go be team of the year. Yeah. And Paul had had, like, such a good year. And, you know, it's probably one reason I didn't think about it because, like, man, ain't nobody catching Paul. And, man, he, he and I were the last, like, two months. Man, it was three or four times it was back and forth. You know, he'd take me this week, I'd win, I'd go back in front and – Man, it was literally like I think the weekend before the last weekend before it got settled last year. So this year reminds me a lot of that too. And it's fun. Um, I've done a lot of points chases over the years. And, um, man, it's kind of fun to have those like down-to-the-wire battles. It makes it a little funner. Awesome. And how many uh, more weeks are there until the season's over? Um, so I think maybe like five or six cooks for me. We, mm -hmm. we, we go to Georgia this week. We'll be in, um, Roswell for the Royal Oak Invitational. So we won't have a CBA and then, you know, it'll be CBAs from here on out. So we'll have the 27th, the fourth, uh, maybe five, five or six off the top of my head. It's, it's not far away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it ain't far away. And you, uh, you got to travel to Georgia, then come back and get ready to compete here in Texas. So Safe travels, man. Best of luck again. Thank you for yeah. being on the podcast. We really appreciate it. If anyone wants to try out Phil's products, we're going to put links in the description. Uh, you guys can pick up his products also at pretty much every single barbecue store in the country. Uh, <laughs> most of them, if they're smart, they're carrying LC products. They're winning products. We use them. We used them to win a couple of times as well. So uh, thank you again, man. We appreciate it and hope you have a good rest of your night. And we appreciate you. Hey, thank you, Gulf Coast Smoke, man. Keep up the killer job on the on the YouTube channel and, and the stuff you're putting out, man. And we enjoy seeing it, and y'all are doing a good job at it. Love the passion. Yeah, Appreciate man. Appreciate you having me. I, I can tell you that's one thing that you'll never not have from us is we 
when you said that you have passion for cooking, man, I promise you we got maybe I don't want to I don't want to put it on a on a gauge, but man, we're there too. We love it more than anything. Awesome. So it's fun yeah, to man. watch. Yes, sir. Well, I appreciate you, Phil. Thank you. Thanks for everything, man. Have yeah, a good night. You. All right. All right, y'all too. Appreciate it. Well, thanks to Phil Breeden, LC Barbecue, for being on the podcast. You know, what was going through my head listening to him talk is when you're watching, you know, like halftime for basketball and they're talking about players or, you know, before the game, after the game, talking about players and they mention um, like basketball knowledge. Yeah. You know, that's what I think is it's not just about playing the game. It's about your basketball knowledge. Right. And that's what I think Phil has. But with barbecue, he not only can he compete well, he has the competition knowledge. He's, I mean, you listen to him talk, and there's just, like, numbers, science, math, all sorts of things going on in that brain, I guarantee. And yeah. I think that's one of the things that takes him, like, to, to another a level. other level. You're correct. I mean, well, I think you're correct. And, you know, one of the cool things about Phil is, I mean, you know, every time we're out there, we say hi. He's He's a cool cat. He's always very respectful to us, and we really – Really, really appreciate him being on the show today. I think that these guests bring so much knowledge that you guys can pick up at least one thing from every single one of our great guests. And Phil is absolutely no exception. Just like I said in the interview, we're going to put a link in the description. All of his products will be there. You guys can go order online. And, man, LC products win. They do. We use all of our own seasonings only. We do use some LC products on our injections. So take that with a grain of salt. Do with that what you will. I'm not afraid to tell you guys right now that we're running LC injections. So I think that you guys should definitely give them a try. If you think that we're cooking good, you want to try and mimic our flavor, Gulf Coast Smoke Seasonings, LC Barbecue Injections, it's proven. So, Yeah. yeah. But, I mean... I think that that was a great interview. I think that we can wrap up the podcast because it was a long interview. We don't want to keep people too long. I I want them to stay interested. (laughs) And like we said earlier, we're going to be competing this weekend in Ingleside, Texas. Wish us luck. Right now, we're probably setting up in Ingleside if you guys are listening on Friday or we're already there hanging out. So thanks for watching or listening. And anything else you wanted to say? No, we'll see you all next week. Peace.